This is KGW News at Noon. Thanks for joining us at noon. I'm China Green. We begin with breaking news in Southeast Portland. One person is in custody, ending an hours long standoff at an apartment near East Burnside and Southeast 122nd. Portland police say a man accused of stabbing a woman locked himself inside an apartment and would not come out. Let's get right to Devin Haskins, who just spoke with police. Devin, what did they just tell you? Yeah, so this all thing started just before 2.30 this morning. Police say that the woman with stab wounds found at the max platform behind me. Now, it's important to note that that's not where the police say the stabbing happened. They're still trying to figure out that location. But the man accused of stabbing that woman was found inside that apartment complex. He barricaded himself in there. And after hours of negotiations, unsuccessful negotiations, police finally went into the apartment with a bang. Well, that explosion you just heard was from Portland police using a small explosive explosive device to break down the door to get inside that apartment where the man was hiding. They say he was found in the bedroom and arrested without any issues. Then moments later, they brought this man in the white shirt out in handcuffs. Police say he'll be charged in the stabbing of a woman that is now at a local hospital expected to live. Police also said that the man was found inside either his or her apartment. It's not clear who that apartment belonged to, but they did add the two did know each other. I do know that there was some kind of um, domestic relationship. I, I don't know to what extent. I don't know if they were married or dating. I, I don't know. They were they were intimate with each other. Yes. Now we don't know the man's name yet. Portland police are yet to release that. They say once he's charged and booking booked into jail, they will give us that man's name and those charges that he is currently facing. Now all the streets are back open this morning. They were closed down for quite some time this morning as this whole thing was unfolding. And they'll say they'll be here for quite some time, though, as they investigate inside that apartment where that man was hiding. For now, that's the latest here in uh, Southeast 122nd and Burnside. Back to you. Devin Haskins reporting live for us this morning and this afternoon. Thank you, Devin. Some somber news this afternoon. Authorities tell us a 17 year old Woodburn student is now dead following a single vehicle crash. Details are limited right now, but they did tell us that alcohol and speed were both a factor in this incident. It happened just around 2 a.m. at the intersection of North Boone's Ferry Road and Vanderbeck Lane. Authorities say the 17 year old was driving in the incident. A 14 year old passenger also in the hospital for life threatening injuries. Another passenger, a 19 year old, was transported for non life threatening injuries. Injuries. Their families have been notified. The investigation is ongoing. Now to the latest in the battle over abortion rights. The OHA created a new website to help people seeking information on abortion care and services. This is what it looks like right here. Governor Tina Kotek says this website reaffirms that abortion remains legal and protected in Oregon. And this comes after the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments yesterday in a case that has to do with access to abortion medication. Alma McCarty spoke with Oregon's Attorney General about what's at stake for the drug Mifepristone. We have strong laws that protect our providers and our patients. And I am here with you today in this fight to keep it that way. Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum on the steps of the United States Supreme Court Tuesday morning defending abortion as essential health care and the abortion pill as a key part of that care. Without access, there is no freedom. This message as the Supreme Court justices heard oral arguments on a case that could significantly restrict access to a commonly used abortion drug called mifepristone. The origins of the case following the FDA's loosening of some restrictions on the drug. In 2021, they were um, loosened to permit uh, telehealth, meaning that you didn't have to actually go to a pharmacy or go to even go to a doctor, but that you could actually get um, a prescription through telehealth. You still had to get a prescription, had to get it by a doctor, but it didn't have to. You didn't have to actually appear in person. The group of anti-abortion doctors who brought the lawsuit claim the FDA didn't adequately evaluate the drug's safety risks and are looking to limit access. We are asking the Supreme Court to hold the FDA accountable for violating the law to the detriment of women's health. But the FDA calls mifepristone safe and effective and says it has been over the last two 
two decades. Millions of Americans have used mifepristone to safely end their pregnancies. As of Tuesday night, abortion access supporters, including Attorney General Rosenblum, say they're hopeful after justices raised questions whether the plaintiffs even had legal standing. That ended up being a big part of the arguments today was whether they even had the right to bring those actions. Because these are doctors and associations that do not perform abortions. That was Alma McCarty reporting for us. Attorney General Rosenblum says even if the Supreme Court rules in favor of the FDA, allowing access to mifepristone, there are other legal challenges ahead. We can expect a decision in the case by this summer. We have an update for you on the bridge collapse in Baltimore. A recovery mission is underway to find the bodies of the six workers who were on the bridge when it collapsed. Two people were rescued from the water yesterday with one treated at a local trauma center. This morning, we learned the NTSB had found the ship's voyage data recorder. That'll help investigators figure out exactly what went wrong. The NTSB also revealed it would begin to interview crew members, fire and rescue, really anyone involved with the collapse or the response to it. And locally, we have plenty of bridges and ships, so the collision and collapse in Maryland has people wondering if something like that could happen here. We spoke with transportation experts yesterday about how our waterways compare. We do have bridges on the Columbia River that have similar truss structure designs. Those include the Astoria Megler Bridge in Astoria and the I-5 bridge that connects Portland and Vancouver. But there are other types of bridges in our area that have various types of cargo ships pass under them. And we're going to be watching this very carefully in the days and the weeks ahead to see what we can learn. Are there any issues that we can find out about this to see if we can improve our safety here in Oregon? We want to know more about what happened. There have been other big bridge disasters this century and last, including in 1980, when a 600 foot cargo ship hit and support structure of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida. The collision caused a 1400 foot section of the roadway to drop, killing 35 people. Turning now to weather, Rod, right before I walked into the studio, it was pouring outside. Yes, <laughs> that's a fair statement. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Want to let you know, downtown Portland and generally speaking, I-5, right along what is now the back edge of the steady rain that is moving off to the east, we're actually getting breaks in the cloud cover back to the coast. So the steady rain part of our day here in the Willamette Valley is now starting to come to an end. Uh, and has come to an end for some of us. Here's a closer look at the radar. We've got now dry weather out in Hillsboro. A few scattered showers, though, out in Washington County. Salem, you've dried out for the time being. A few scattered showers back to your west. The coast is actually broken out into some nice sunshine. Here's Cannon Beach Live, 52 degrees, light winds right now. There's a pretty good chop. The uh, sea's coming in at about 10 feet today. It's actually a warning for increased sneaker wave threat today tomorrow and Friday. That's from our Snookwins Casino Resort Cam in Lincoln City, where it's 53. Now the valley, the range is stopping, so it's still pretty cloudy. Here's Willamette Valley Vineyards off of I-5, just south of Salem. Downtown Portland, cloudy, still raindrops in downtown itself, but those will be ending here, or at least breaking up soon. We're at 52. Some sun breaks to come this afternoon. The rain becoming scattered, not ending, scattered. We'll have the forecast into the weekend, which does show Dry sun. weather, that's coming up. It shows sun. <laughs> yes. oh, thank you. It's no surprise that homelessness will be one of the big topics in local elections this year. And we wanted to hear how the candidates running for Portland mayor will address the problem. Three of the top candidates are currently on city council. And this month, Blair Best sat down with Commissioner Renee Gonzalez. Now, he is not promising to end homelessness like some of the other candidates that we've heard from, but pledges to create stricter policies. Many people argue that your response to homelessness is too harsh. One example is calling for Portland Street response to stop handing out tents. How do you plan without adequate, adequate shelter to make change in this crisis in a humane way? Yeah, I mean, w what we're seeing is some really uh, debilitating drug use and self-destructive behavior in certain segments of our unsheltered population. We cannot continue to feed that beast. It wasn't just tents and tarps. They stopped the distribution of drug kits. So if elected, you'll continue to call for no more handing out tents and tarps? Absolutely not, except for potentially in sanctioned camping sites. 
You can watch Blair's full interview with Commissioner Gonzalez tonight on KGW News at 5 and 6.30. Her interviews with other candidates are up now on our KGW YouTube page and website. And we'll sit down with Commissioner Carmen Rubio in the coming weeks.